This video is sponsored by Amaze. The USSR's Ekranoplan, or better known as the Caspian Sea Monster, was a giant ground effect aircraft that could hover above the sea. It was big, used frightening new physics seemingly beyond then current technology, and terrified the West. But the United States, in a Cold War fury, didn't want to be left behind. And they came up with their own version of the Ekranoplan. It was called the Parwig, seating up to 20 crew members and had a range of over 2,000 nautical miles. But its secret was that it wouldn't fire anti-ship rockets like the USSR version, but rather nuclear trident missiles as part of a strategic deterrent. This is the story of the American-made Ekranoplan. Before we dive right into today's video, here's a quick little lesson in Aerodynamics 101. An aircraft needs three things in order to fly safely. Lift, propulsion, control. The higher above an aircraft is, the better it is able to attain all three factors. That's why flying consistently at extremely low altitudes is extremely difficult. Little wonder then that an aircraft able to fly for extended periods at extremely low altitudes, known as a ground effect aircraft, is one of the holy grails of aircraft design and engineering. And by extremely low altitude, we mean by literally a few feet or meters. So how does this work? Most aircraft need high forward velocity that allows the aircraft to lift off at a low speed. An aircraft with what is called a wing in ground or wig can achieve its ground effect concept by enabling the thrust downwards under the leading edge of the wings instead of having to rely purely on forward air velocity. This creates a high pressure cushion under the wing which gives the craft its needed lift. Which also explains why wig designs have their engines in front of their wings. Lift is further improved by adding downward tilted wingtip plates that trap the high pressure air and prevent said air from being squeezed out and escaping. Wingspans are kept as short as possible to maximize this downward thrust. The wings need a large radius leaning edge and a thick shape. This means that air passing over the upper surface of the wing travels significantly further and hence faster compared to the air that travels over the wing of a conventional shape and thickness typical of most aircraft. Also known as ground effect vehicles or GEVs, one can imagine that these craft are riding on a dynamic air cushion similar to that of an inflated skirt around the hull of a hovercraft. A WIG aircraft capitalize on significantly less resistance when flying just above the water by getting the aerodynamic lift needed for that aircraft to fly. If it flies too high, it loses that lift and will become subsequently unstable. A WIG craft is intended to cruise just above the wave crests in open water, with only very occasionally and slightest contact with the water during flight. Another name for WIG aircraft is wing ship, which is why these are sometimes referred to as flying boats. However, often mistaken for an aeroplane, seaplane, hovercraft or hydrofoil, GEVs are recognized as a distinct technology. This technology was so unique at the time that if an Ekranoplan could be given as a prize, Omaze would have done it. Amaze gives away one-of-a-kind prizes and experiences while donating money to chosen charities. This sustainable approach allows charities to spend time doing what they do best rather than fundraising. And boy, do I have to tell you about the prize today. If you donate $10, you are entered for a chance to win a fully kitted out Tesla Model S Plaid. It has a 400 mile range a 1,020 horsepower engine and can go 0 to 60 in 2 seconds. That's faster than a Concorde. 
This is all to support a fantastic charity called Reverb. They partner with musicians, festivals, and venues to green their concerts while encouraging fans to take environmental and social action. So far, they have eliminated 3 million single use plastic bottles, supported 2,000 family farmers, and raised attention to over 4,000 local non profits. Pretty cool stuff. To potentially win the Tesla Model S played, to support Reverb, go to omaze.com slash FNE. Back to the Ukraine plans. There are even disputes between the UK on one side and the United States and European Union on the other as to whether or not wigs should be classified as boats or aircraft. It's the British who classify a wig as an aircraft, whilst the Americans and Europeans think it's a boat. We'll go with the British on this one and call wigs aircraft today. There are also upsides to WIG aircraft, including that they are able to fly at extremely low altitude and with huge range. Being able to cruise at such a low altitude means that they are below the range of most radars. Their unique lift means that WIG aircraft can also carry much heavier cargo than conventional aircraft of the same size, whilst being up to five times more fuel efficient than conventional aircraft flying without the benefit of ground effect. Unfortunately, there are many traditional downsides to WIG aircraft as well, such as being an aircraft that can only fly at very low altitudes and at quite low speeds. They are also incredibly difficult to turn at higher speeds. Obviously, a WIG cannot bank into a turn because it's so close to the surface of the water. This also makes them very difficult or even impossible to manoeuvre in tight spaces such as small harbours, ports, rivers and canals. Furthermore, a WIG is notoriously difficult aircraft to dock. Now, a lot of you might be hearing me saying the word WIG over and over again and imagining that I'm talking about something that you put on your head, but I want to say that this is just my interpretation of saying it and it makes the topic of this video, the PAR WIG, sound a lot better than seeing the P-A-R-W-I-G over and over again. Anyway, back to the show. Lastly, another huge downside is that the top of the wing catching the water at too high an angle can have disastrous effects. Plus, we can't ignore the fact that a wig aircraft with a high structural load can be seriously compromised in its handling and maneuverability. This increases the risk of the plane pitching into the water and capsizing. But that didn't stop the Soviet Union jumping headfirst straight into this idea. Neither the Soviets nor the Americans were the first to develop a WIG aircraft. That honour went to Finland's Toyo Kario when he painted in his design in 1935. But as with many aviation feats during the Cold War, it was the Soviet Union that mastered WIG aircraft design. The Ekranoplan KM, which was also dubbed the Caspian Sea Monster, was developed by the Soviets in the 1960s, primarily for military cargo transport and missile delivery applications. The KM stood for prototype ship in Russian. There is a reason why this project has been dubbed the Soviet superplane program that rattled Area 51. The CIA was so freaked out by the original Soviet Ekranoplan project that it developed an unmanned drone named Aquiline in the 1960s in order to spy on the Soviet plane, as alleged in the book Area 51, An Uncensored History of America's Top Secret Military Base. But I can't do what happened next justice, so why don't I hand things over to my good friend from Paper Skies, Dmitri. Thanks, Nick. The original Ekranoplan KM's ground effect was attained with its use of extended wings with negative dihedral winglets. The nifty touch with the winglets meant the wings could touch water if the KM was unintentionally flown too low, although it did substantially increase the plane's drag. This meant the structural weight of the wing had to be increased to account for water loads, making it one heavy aircraft. The Soviets pioneered the power augmented ram wind and ground effect, known as Parwig. With better engine placement, an air cushion was created during the entire flight of the aircraft, resulting in greater lift. A Parwig aircraft could better negotiate relatively rough sea conditions with relatively low thrust. Unfortunately, engines mounted near the nose of the aircraft meant that they were very vulnerable to the intake of salt spray and marine debris, both of which could cause damage to the engines. 
However, unlike other weak aircraft, the Ukraine plane and other par weak planes have one distinct and hugely important feature for any military. They can be phenomenally fast. The man behind this ingenious feat of engineering was Rostislav Evgenievich Alexeyev, who was a revered figure in Soviet aerodynamics. Every Ukraine plan and par weak plane ever planned since then has been based on Alexeyev's design methodology. The KM was the largest aircraft on Earth when it finally took to the waters of the Caspian Sea in 1966. It was 295 feet long, could attain flight with a total weight of 600 tons and operated at a cruising speed of 310 miles per hour. However, the KM never went beyond prototype and it crashed and sank in accident in 1980, supposedly due to pilot error. The smaller, less heavy and improved Lunia Kranoplan was built and deployed by the Soviets in 1987. Even though smaller than the original KM Behemoth, the Lunia Kranoplan still weighed in at 380 tons, had a 148-foot wingspan and, most worrying of all for analysts at the Pentagon, could launch six anti-ship missiles from flight. We are talking six supersonic P-270 Mosquito anti-ship missiles that could reach Mach 3, which is more than triple the speed of the subsonic Harpoon missile that remains as standard in the US Navy. Luckily for the Pentagon, the loon was eventually mothballed by the Russian military in the 1990s. But that wouldn't stop the US from coming up with their own version of the Ukraine plan. The United States never willingly lagged behind the USSR with any technology. WIG aircraft were no different. The David W. Taylor Naval Ship Research and Development Center in Bethesda, Maryland produced a par wig prototype design in 1977. The aircraft was designed for sea control missions as well as potentially transoceanic passenger and cargo transport. The ultimate goal of the American par wig plane, however, was a strategic deterrent, since it was designed to carry four GM-96A Trident sea-launched ballistic missiles as its payload. Importantly, these missiles would have been fired while the aircraft was resting on the ocean surface, not while still in flight, like the Boeing 747 nuclear carrier that I have right here on the channel. The American par wing design included a chubby and stubby reversed clipped delta main wing with flexible downward end plates. These were designed to trap a steady, constant air cushion for the aircraft. The engine had thrust diverters for takeoff which would direct jet exhaust towards the underside of the wing leading edge. This would help build up the air cushion under the wings needed for liftoff. Four of the aircraft's engines would shut down during cruise flying, leaving just two engines to drive all four fans for maximum fuel economy. The upsides of the American par wig was that it could fly out two thousand nautical miles and settle anywhere on the sea, with intermittent sorties out to sea before returning to base. In theory, the par wig could be too fast to be stalked by ships or submarines and too far out of sea to be attacked by conventional military aircraft, fitting right in that gap of military power s of America's enemies. Furthermore, it was thought that the aircraft could be fitted with a high number of smaller and more nimble cruise missiles, although obviously this would mean that the craft would have to get a lot closer to enemy territory, so its potential as a cruise missile carrier was quickly scrapped. Here are some interesting statistics regarding the US par week plane. It would have 20 crew and a span of approximately 146 feet or 44.5 meters and a total area on board of 10,225 square feet or 3,000 meters. It would come in with a weight of 2 million pounds or nearly a million kilograms and when it didn't have any nukes on board it would float at around 627,000 pounds or 284,000 kilograms. It would have a general cruise speed of 180 to 330 knots with a maximum up to 400 knots where the weather and, and water surface permitted. And I can't believe you're going to ask me to say this, but it would have a cruise altitude of 12 feet or 3.65 meters, which is a little bit funny considering the rest of the videos on this channel involved aircraft that could go easily up to 120,000 feet. Finally, the American par wig 10 days loiter out at sea. So why was it never built? Honestly, it's because the United States had no need for one. 
These kinds of large wing and ground effect aircraft, while impressive, really serve no military purpose and provide no major military advantage for the US armed forces to possess. Aside from the internal Great Lakes, there are no major bodies of water within the United States of America where such a craft could be readily employed and no need to position strategic or tactical assets there. Both the Atlantic and the Pacific Oceans were covered with US Navy in the form of carrier battle groups and submarine fleets which provide portable power projection for undersea, surface and air operations virtually anywhere else in the globe. So in summary, large wing and ground effect aircraft do not provide a significant increase in America's power projection when compared to existing options. In the early 1980s, there was a US Navy plan to conduct flight tests using the Hughes Hercules aircraft to study ground effects. It wasn't expressly designed as an Ukraine plan, but its enormous wings benefited from ground effects. You might recall that the only flight that it ever did, it never actually escaped its ground effect. Sadly, that plan never came to be, and we missed the opportunity to see the giant back in the air. In the aftermath of the collapse of the Soviet Union, the Russian government believed that the Akrona plan had a bright future as a commercial plane with an updated model. Its direct translation was called the Little Eagle, and it measured 190 feet or 58 meters in length, and a maximum takeoff weight of 275,000 pounds or 125 tons. It was similar in size to a medium-sized wide-body airliner such as the Boeing 767. The Russians dreamed of these planes crisscrossing the globe carrying everything from passengers and cargo. However, tragedy struck when the aircraft ditched during a flight prior to a public exhibition aimed at foreign investors in 1992. One crew member was killed and the remaining nine all badly injured. The crash did much to crush the potential of ground effect aircraft for civilian transportation. Even so, the aviation world remains abuzz with talk of civilian Ekrano plans being developed and even painted it by Russian designers. Secrecy shrouds these alleged projects, although Russian insiders have commented that any contemporary versions of civilian Ekrano plans would be different in one regard to one distinct and important factor. Comfort. There was a somewhat sad, even pitiful end for the sole remaining Lunna Krana plan that was mothballed by the Russians in the 1990s. The plane had been docked, slowly decaying on the Caspian Sea in the city of Kaspersky in the Russian-controlled Republic of Dagestan. Its fortunes were set to change when it was to be converted into a museum. However, Popular Mechanics reported in August of 2020 how the towing of the large aircraft to its new location had gone terribly wrong. The Ilana Krana plan now sits adrift in shallow water on a beach in the Caspian Sea. It seems a pathetic end to what remains one of the most brilliant feats of specialized aviation engineering. As H.L. Sutton of Forbes writes, it will be a tragedy for military history if this unique craft is broken into pieces by the powers of nature. It would indeed be a tragedy. The child of the original Caspian Sea monster surely deserves a better end than that. Thanks so much for watching this video today. I want to say a very special thank you to Paper Skies for jumping in and helping me out with the Russian side of the Akronoplan history and how he was able to bring his unique perspective to what could have been. I also want to say a very special thank you to Scott of Secret Projects Review who had the original blueprints for the US design. So if you really want to find out more about crazy US and also some Russian designs, you go over there right now and check out what's going on. And don't forget to click on the Amaze link below to check out the one of a kind prize. And lastly, I also want to say a very special thank you to my Patreons. If you would like to become a Patreon and a supporter of the channel, then you can right here. As a Patreon, you get to see videos early, decide on what topics I get to do, and jump onto a special Discord where you can talk to me directly whenever you want. So thank you again so much for watching.